So over the past nine months or so, I've been building a Python library, which is called Pi Tomography. Now there's a full website, a full read the docs, tons of API information about how all the different classes and functions look. And this video is sort of intended to be an expose of that software. So the question is, what is Pi Tomography and what is it all about? Well, it turns out Pi Tomography is a library I developed to help with my own research, which is entirely concerned with medical imaging. To understand the purpose of Pi Tomography, you have to understand the paradigm of medical imaging. Of course, when you think of what imaging is all about, any sort of medical imaging, it's very simple, right? In all cases of imaging, whether it's CT or SPECT or MRI, the purpose is you want some sort of 3D map of the patient. In a CT scan, that's a 3D map of density. In nuclear medicine, where you're injecting a patient with radioactive material to treat cancer, you want a 3D map of radioactivity everywhere in space. Now, when you build your real physical systems, your SPECT scanners, your PET scanners, uh, your CT scanners, those don't directly give you 3D data like that. You collect raw data using some sort of scanner technology. So Pi Tomography is a way of taking that raw data and making 3D maps of the patient. And it's right now really focused on SPECT imaging and SPECT reconstruction. Anyways, this video is pretty long. It's around an hour long, but it's still just a very basic introduction to the library, what it's capable of, but also an interesting introduction to how SPECT imaging works and sort of the paradigm of medical imaging. So if that's something you're interested in learning about, I think this video will be very useful. As always, if you enjoy the content, please be sure to like and subscribe and enjoy Pi Tomography. If you guys want to support the channel and learn how to code just like me, I highly recommend checking out my Udemy course, Python STEM Essentials. Coupon code in the description, you can get the course for $10 for the next five days. So the concept of a spec scan is actually very basic. The idea behind this sort of scan, which falls into the category of nuclear medicine, is that you inject a patient with a radioactive molecule and that radioactive molecule is attached to a biomarker that looks for disease and so you inject it in someone's blood system, it travels throughout their body and then it binds to tumor cells. Of course it doesn't just bind to tumor cells, it also goes to the brain, it'll go to the kidneys and uh, the bladder and the liver, there's other organs that uptake it, but the biological molecules really look for tumor cells. So you inject someone with this, it's radioactive, it goes to the tumor cells and delivers the radiation dose. So here I have a really simple example of sort of what a spec scan would look like. And there's two sort of concepts that we need to discuss when we talk about a, a spec scan. There's the, um, the quantity here, which I call F, and it's a function of X, Y, and Z. So that's locations in space. And it's basically just a um, field. And at every location in space, there's a certain activity of the radioactivity. So for example, this region here, this red region, that's like hot radioactivity and then maybe there's less radioactivity in other regions in space. So F essentially quantifies what is the radioactivity at every point in space. And so this is sort of what you want to get when you take a spec scan. You want to scan a patient and see where is all this radioactivity located in the patient. Now the way that you take a scan of the patient is using basically a camera. It's called a gamma camera. It's what's used in a spec system. It's basically like a sheet and uh, photons get emitted from the patient. They travel perpendicular. Well, they travel in all directions. The camera is set up, and we'll get into this later, that it only allows perpendicular photons to enter the uh, camera, and they get detected. And so you basically get like a projection mapping of whatever this looks like here onto the camera uh, surface. So the camera's a plane like this, and uh, the photons travel, and you sort of get an image in uh, what's R, and Z. So R is sort of like one direction, Z is the other direction. Uh, but this camera here actually rotates around the patient. So it's like you're taking a bunch of 2D images at different angles, and uh, the angle is specified by theta. So the actual data that you collect on a SPECT uh, camera, it's not F directly. What you directly collect is G, so a bunch of 2D images at different uh, angles. So the F of XY, the actual units are measured in decays per second, so that measures how radioactive something is. Uh, G is measured by the number of counts uh, detected by the detector. So the photon comes out, it hits the detector, and then you get a count. And so G is measured directly in counts. It's important to understand the paradigm of what's happening here. In any imaging system you take, and this is not just for SPECT, it's for PET, MRI, CT, 
what you're measuring is something like, in this case, I've talked about G for spec, but you measure G, so you measure the raw data for that particular imaging system, and you want to reconstruct F. So you want to go from G to F. You measure G, you want to get an estimate for F. That's what reconstruction really is all about. Now, it turns out, with there's various algorithms that can do this, you actually need a model of the imaging system, right? And so what is the imaging system? Well, the imaging system isn't G to F. The imaging system says, if you give me an F, what is the G that I can expect to get? And this is actually an easier problem in terms of modeling. So the question is, if we have F, how can we get G? How can we actually build a model to get what G would look like given a, a specific F? Well, there's different ways to do this. You could write a Monte Carlo simulation where you track photons throughout the body. Uh, you sort of simulate the physics of the detector and you track a bunch of events and eventually uh, you get a sort of suitable looking G by running a Monte Carlo simulation. Now in practice, that's really computationally expensive and we'll actually look at some data that was generated that way in this video, but that's not typically what's done in reconstruction. Now the other way to do this is to derive an analytical model for the imaging system. So I'm gonna write this as follows. G equals some operator H, which we'll define times F. So the question is, what does H actually look like here? Well, it turns out that when the number of photons emitted is within a reasonable range that's done in clinical practice, H is a linear operator. So what does it mean that something is a linear operator? Well, it means if I image part of F and then I image another part of F, so for example, I image the liver and the kidney and I, I take two images G. So for example, suppose this is a, a kidney and this is part of the liver. If I image these separately and I get two different Gs and I add those together, it's the same as if I imaged both at the same time. So that's, that's the concept of linearity. And there are some cases where that actually breaks when you have really high photon count and you can mess with the detector electronics. But in most cases, it's a linear operator. Uh, one of the beautiful things about that, since H is a linear operator and G and a, uh, F in this case are finite dimensional. Well, really F is infinite dimensional, but if you sort of discretize into individual voxels, uh, then F becomes finite dimensional for image reconstruction then H can be represented by a matrix. And this is typically known as the system matrix. So you define a matrix operation H, where if I multiply F by this matrix H, or you might say, well, F is three dimensional here, so H is a tensor, it's a multi-dimensional tensor. Well, really you can represent F by a one dimensional vector. Uh, so you have your uh, matrix H here, and then you can basically operate on F to get G. And that's the analytical model of the imaging system. Don't worry too much about the actual implementation of that, but that's essentially a way to model the imaging system. So this is some of the features of pie tomography. Pie tomography will give you this matrix H. And you might wonder, okay, you can model a spec system. Why is it important? It turns out that in all image reconstruction algorithms, this matrix H is super, super important and we're gonna need it. Furthermore, we're gonna need its transposed operation. So if you have a matrix H, there's also a transpose operation. This shows up all the time in image reconstruction algorithms. Okay, so let's actually do some system modeling before before we get into uh, image reconstruction. Like I said, image modeling is essential as a part of image reconstruction algorithms. Uh, so we'll start by opening a basic 3D distribution. So here I'm uh, importing zoom from SciPy. I'm basically gonna open some raw binary data. Uh, it's 768 by 512 by 512. Those are the dimensions. And I'm basically just resizing it a little bit. So if I um, sort of open that data, I resize it so that it becomes half as many pixels and then as quarter of as many voxels in these two. So it's really gonna be half, so 384 by 128 by 128. That's essentially what I'm doing here, just making it a little bit smaller. Uh, and then I switch the X and Z axes. So I swap this and this. That just keeps it in a shape that's consistent with the library. Uh, and then I scale it a little bit. So anyways, if I run this code, I get my true image. This is the thing that I want to, so my F truth here and we're going to do system modeling to get uh, G here. So let's actually look at what F-truth looks like. This is basically like a very simple um, example of what a patient might look like when you inject them with radioactivity. So each voxel has associated activity with it uh, in uh, units of megabecquerels, so that's millions of decays per second. So that's a way to measure radioactivity. And of course, it looks 2D here, but really what we have is a 3D object, and I can look at different, these are called coronal slices by the terminology and I can move through the different slices of the patient essentially. So what I really have here is a full 3D representation of what the activity in space looks like. And of course we can now model an imaging system in pie tomography to say, well, what does the uh, scan, what does G look like in this case? Okay, so this is where you get a little bit into the detector 
mathematics here. Well, each of these are in units of megabecquerels, but the detector will detect counts, right? So there's a unit conversion that has to go here. Well, it turns out that for some radioactive materials, not every decay emits a photon. Maybe it releases an electron or something else. And more importantly, not all of those photons get detected. Some simply miss the detector. Some get absorbed in what's known as the collimator. We'll talk about that shortly. In fact, a lot of them get absorbed through the collimator. And some of them simply pass through the detector and don't even get detected. So a typical calibration factor uh, order of magnitude is about 10. So the question is, what does that calibration factor allow you to convert between? Well, this factor is in units of counts per second per megabecquerel. So we have to unpack that a little bit. Well, the first per megabecquerel is really easy. It means the more uh, activity here you get in megabecquerels, the more um, the higher response you're going to get in the detector itself when you take the spec scan. Uh, the per second is also really easy. Of course, the longer you take the scan, the more photons are going to hit the scanner. Um, that relates to more photons being detected. So this calibration factor scales by both the activity of the patient and how long you take the scan for. So what this says is every megabecquerel, every megabecquerel of activity that's in the patient, and for every second, you're going to expect 10 detected counts. Now that's pretty major, because remember a megabecquerel is a million decays per second. And of all those a million decays per second, uh, if we suppose that we're imaging for one second, we only expect 10 counts. So you can see that a spec system has a very low efficiency of detecting all the different photons that are emitted. So we can use this calibration factor and assume that, okay, we're gonna scan for 15 seconds per projection. If we multiply this in units of megabecquerels times the time per projection, we're going to get units of counts. So this becomes our scaled image here. So we'll get the calibration factor. And now we can see that our units, um, these are the photons that are emitted that are going to be detected by the detector, the amount that we expect to be detected by the detector. Uh, in reality, these counts, of course, are going to follow a Poisson distribution. Remember, radioactivity is essentially random, right? It's Poisson distributed. The number of counts that are actually emitted uh, is going to be a Poisson distributed. So these, this represents the mean of the Poisson distribution. Um, but if we actually run a real experiment, of course, we're going to get random numbers. So we can call the uh, uh, NumPy random Poisson function on this to get the truth, scaled, and then the noise. And so these is really like the number of counts that would be detected by the detector. Um, and in a realistic physical scenario where, of course, data is Poisson. Of course, you're not uh, detecting for an infinitely long period of time, so only so many decays will occur in each voxel, and that's random. Okay, so now let's see. Okay, we've, we've simulated this 3D distribution in space. The number of photons that are going to be emitted that will be detected by the detector. That's what we've done so far. We haven't even talked about G yet. Um, and so in order to get G, we're going to use pi tomography. Remember, pi tomography needs system modeling. We need to go from F to G because that functionality will be used in reconstruction algorithms to eventually go from G to F. And of course, this is just an example here of, of the system modeling. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is we want to define all the relevant physical parameters of our system. The, the camera is going to depend on sort of what the spacing looks like here in terms of distance, how far away the camera is from the patient, uh, and other things. So in this case, I'm assuming that each voxel has dimension uh, 0 0.3 centimeters. I also give the, sh the full shape of the array. So this is going to be stored in the spec object metadata variable. So there's object meta that tells you everything you need to know sort of about the images F that we're considered with. Uh, the second thing is going to be the projection meta. Remember that we're going to take a scan, for example, at different angles. Of course, we can specify what those angles are going to be. We can specify how far the detector is from the patient and things like that. Uh, so basically what we do is we give the shape of the projections. So in this case, the shape of the projections is basically going to be uh, this 2D shape here of the patient. That's what I give it. And for this simple, very basic experiment, I'm going to scan the patient at an angle of zero degrees, 20 degrees, and 40 degrees. So the camera is going to be positioned at different uh, locations around the patient. And in each of those cases, the camera is going to be 15 centimeters away. So what that means is that the camera moves in a circular path around the patient, and the radius point to the center of rotation is 15 centimeters. So we're going to find this object and projection meta, of course, part of the... Um, uh, functionality pi tomography, you can view, of course, the, the pixel spacing and things like that. Don't worry so much about things like this right now. Uh, and then, of course, the projection metadata as well, which will give things like the angles, the number of projections. So we're looking at three different uh, angles uh, and the corresponding radii as well. Okay, so before we get into really the 
sophisticated modeling of the system matrix. Uh, right now we're gonna use a very basic model. And that very basic model is essentially as follows. If you look at the image here, we're basically gonna take all the photons here and they just travel perpendicular to the detector and get detected. So you're basically taking a projection of the 3D patient. That's a very basic model and it's very inaccurate, but it's a good way to think about before we get into all the details, essentially what's happening with the spec system. The photons are moving like this, perpendicular to the detector. There's a collimator that stops one from moving, for example, like in a diagonal direction. Um, it moves perpendicular to the detector and gets detected. So that's the first very basic model for our system matrix. Uh, and so you'll see that these are basically empty list arguments right now. We're going to fill these with things later as we simulate the, um, as we drive an analytical model for the physical phenomenon that occurs in the spec detector. For now, we'll leave them blank. We'll use our very basic model. Uh, the system matrix, remember that's the H that maps from F to G. Um, this also takes in the object metadata and the projection metadata. Of course, if we're using the system matrix, we need to know which uh, angles we're going to actually image at. So here I have my uh, system matrix. Um, and you'll note that the F uh, truth right now, scaled noise, this is a NumPy array, right? And I look at the shape of it, it's a NumPy array with uh, a shape as follows, 128 by 128 by 384. And what we want to do is we want to convert it to a Pi Torch tensor. So Pi tomography runs really fast because it uses GPU operations. If you see my other tutorial videos on using Pi Torch GPU to speed things up, that's essentially what this library is based on. We want to make fast reconstruction algorithms with the GPU. So we're going to use the functionality of Pi Torch to do that. So what we need to do is convert this NumPy array into a Pi Torch tensor. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're creating a PyTorch tensor. We actually give it an extra dimension at the beginning. That's the batch size. You can actually model separate images at the same time. We'll get to that a bit later. Uh, and then we put it to the uh, device that PyTomography is using. So that's going to be the GPU and the data type as well. Of course, you can change those in PyTomography. But basically, if we look at finput.shape now, we now have a, a 1 by 128 by 128 by 384 tensor. Uh, this extra dimension of 1 that what that allows you to do is if you have different objects, so different patients, for example, uh, you can actually uh, use the system matrix to model multiple of them at the same time. So this serves as sort of a batch dimension. And then it's really easy to model the imaging system. You call the forward method of the system matrix. So we created the system matrix above, and we're going to call the forward method on F input to get G. This is basically the equation G equals HF. So now we've modeled our imaging system and we can look at, for example, the projection at 40 degrees. So remember that uh, if we look at the shape of G, this is really useful. We also have the batch dimension here. Of course, that will correspond to the number of uh, objects that we're feeding through the system matrix. And we have a dimension of three here. And that dimension of three corresponds to the different angles. And then the final dimensions, 128 by 384, well, those are the actual projections itself. So you can see that my camera's on an angle and I have a very basic sort of scan of the patient. And like I said, you can look at different angles. So this would be 40 degrees. This corresponds to 20 degrees. And then this first one corresponds to zero degrees. So we've done a very basic model of a spec camera. But of course, a real spec system is slightly more complicated than that. It's not just a matter of photons traveling, getting detected and hitting the detector uh, perpendicular. In sophisticated spec modeling, there's two important factors that need to be taken into account. Uh, the first is attenuation correction. So it's really important to note that not all of the photons simply exit the body and get detected in the detector. The photons are going to interact with stuff surrounding them. So if I go back up to this image here, essentially what I'm saying is that some of these photons are going to hit the detector, but some of them are going to be attenuated by the sort of biological material of the patient. And furthermore, sort of the farther back that these photons are, the more material they have to travel through before they hit the camera. So the probability of a photon actually making it to the camera based on how far back it is, how much biological material it has to go through to reach the camera, these ones are gonna have a much smaller probability of hitting the camera than the closer ones up. So when you're modeling the system, you need to adjust for that in your system matrix. You need to make it so that these photons here give less of a contribution than the photons sort of, um, than the photons located closer to the camera. That's called attenuation correction. So we'll look at that first. Um, the other is collimator detector response modeling, and I'll sort of talk about that a little bit more later. That has to do with the fact that not all photons um, are perfectly perpendicular to the detector when they get detected. Um, and we'll talk about the collimator in a second, how that sort of works. So let's start with attenuation correction. 
So what attenuation correction requires is knowing the attenuation coefficient everywhere in space. So if you want to know like how likely this photon is to get absorbed by the patient, well, it's more likely to get absorbed in bone than muscle or water or things like that. So you need a full 3D map of what the attenuation coefficient looks like or the probability of the photon getting um, absorbed in that particular voxel. Now, thankfully, and this is a huge part of research and history of the past of medical imaging, thankfully, a CT scan gives you that information. So it's interesting when they do any SPECT scan now or PET scan for that matter, they also take a corresponding CT scan uh, with it before they do the SPECT scan. And the reason for that is to allow you to get the attenuation map of the patient so you can better reconstruct the patient data. So whenever you take a SPECT scan, there's a CT scan. And the CT scan has its own reconstruction algorithms. Again, that's not the purpose of pi tomography right now. Um, we're looking at SPECT reconstruction, but right now we'll assume we have a full CT uh, reconstruction. So we need the attenuation map everywhere in space. And so basically I have um, this attenuation map here. It's called uh, body1.hct. So this is basically a attenuation map of the patient everywhere in space. And we can look at it so that we sort of get an idea of what the uh, radioactivity distribution looks like versus the attenuation map. And so the, this is sort of representative of how radioactive the patient is everywhere in space. So where the radioactive molecule goes when you inject the patient with it. Uh, the attenuation map is independent of anything radioactive. This is simply a CT scan where they shine really bright photons through you. They shine x-rays through you. Um, and they get a scan that looks like this. I mean, a CT scan is basically a 3D x-ray. And the more denser uh, regions, of course, are more likely to absorb photons. So this gives you sort of a density map of the patient. And when it's in units of attenuation coefficient, so this has units of centimeters inverse, this tells you how likely the photon is to be uh, attenuated. Um, so a photon, for example, coming out of the kidney and traveling out of the patient, well, you can use this map to do um, attenuation correction when you model the photons moving out of the patient. So you can use this information here in the system matrix H to adjust for the probabilities of photons being uh, attenuated. So we have our attenuation map. We have our um, object F here. Now, what you could do is you could put the attenuation map in the system matrix as follows. Uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to define an attenuation transform. So this is something that um, basically you could think of the system matrix as projecting the image. Um, that's what we did before. You take a 3D image and you project it and you get a 2D image. These transforms are operations you apply to F before you project it. That's essentially why it's written sort of like this. And by the way, if you want to know the probability of a photon being attenuated, it's given by this function here. So it's e to the negative integral of mu of x dx. So um, this sort of integrates along a path, a straight path that the photon travels. And so the more attenuation material it goes through, um, scaled, of course, by dx, the higher probability is of being detected. So for example, if the detector was put maybe to the right of the patient here, photons from the left-hand side are much less likely to be detected than ones from the right-hand side, which have less attenuating material to travel through. Depends on the position of the um, detector, the angle that you're imaging at. Um, so that, that, that's a really important factor. Of course, this is all taken into account in pi tomography. So you define your attenuation transform, and then in your object to object transforms argument, you actually give the attenuation transform here. So now I have a system matrix that models this attenuation of photons. So we can now use this more advanced system matrix to say what the spect image would look like. Uh, so now I have G attenuated and we can compare it to the original G. So you can see, for example, the scales of the color bars here are the same. Of course, this image is much darker than this image because many of the photons have been attenuated. So when we model the system, and this is at an angle of 40 degrees, you can see that many of the photons here have been attenuated. Furthermore, the ones that were attenuated were likely ones that were further back in the patient from the detector before we projected to get this image here. So that's sort of the first thing we need to account for when we model the SPECT system. Uh, the other thing is collimator detector response, or PSF, that stands for point spread function. They're sort of used synonymously here, uh, modeling. And so what does that account for? Well, you'll notice that in the diagram above that I have here, you'll notice that I sort of draw these arrows like the photons are entering perpendicular to the detector. And the detector is specially set up that way to only allow photons traveling perpendicular to enter. And so what I have here is an image of sort of how that sort of works. You can think of these black things. They're, a little, they're much thicker than this. This is an exaggerated diagram, of course. Um, they're sort of like walls here. And so you, if you imagine that you have a radioactive material that's emitting photons in all directions, 
by placing these walls here uh, filled with lead, it stops photons traveling sort of in these very um, wide directions from entering the detector, and it only allows photons that are almost perpendicular to the detector to enter. Now, of course, in reality, like what we've assumed above here is that all the photons are perfectly perpendicular. That's what happens when you sum along an axis, when you project. You're assuming that the photons are basically just entering perpendicular to the detector. But in reality, that's not what happens. There's sort of a little bit of leeway here with the angle that they can be detected at. So the way you account for this actually is by blurring the object, by blurring F before you project along a dimension. And so this is CDR modeling, and what this depends on, of course, is going to be the collimator geometry itself. And so there are different collimator geometries for different SPECT imaging systems. Uh, in this case, we're going to choose a Siemens medium energy collimator. So what basically what that gives is it gives the width of the walls, uh, the number of holes, sort of things like that. And so this is designed for medium energy photon SPECT detection. And so you also need to give the energy of the photons you're detecting. Of course, higher energy photons are more likely to penetrate the lead and that will change the blurring. Uh, so now we actually have to give an energy of the photons that we're proposing to model. So in this case, we'll give a 208 keV so that this scan represents a lutetium scan. Lutetium-177, the main photon emitted, has an energy of 208 keV. Uh, so our PSF metadata, where we're gonna choose uh, SY-ME. So this means Siemens medium energy. And there's a bunch of different strings you can give here for different types of collimators in pi tomography, but we'll focus on this one because it's a very commonly used one in SPECT imaging. So this gives you your PSF uh, metadata. Of course, we can look at it as well. It tells you a little bit about the mathematical modeling of it. Don't worry too much about that. And then we define a transform similar to the uh, attenuation transform. And this transform essentially operates on F before summation occurs or projection occurs in the system matrix. So now that we have both a PSF transform and an attenuation transform, we can build a full system matrix that models the SPECT imaging system. Uh, so we give these as arguments and object to object transforms. It turns out you have to do attenuation transform before PSF modeling. And we get our full system matrix. And now we can use our full system matrix to get G is equal to H times F essentially. And now we can compare all three different G's here. So the simple model, no attenuation or PSF modeling, of course you get a lot of counts. Uh, with attenuation modeling, you get less counts. And then with attenuation plus PSF modeling, you get a slightly blurred looking image here. So you can see that everything is slightly blurred compared to the image that you see here. So we now have a good system model for what a spec scan would look like given an initial distribution F of the patient. So what we basically have now is a full system matrix H that accurately measures or is able to get data G that we expect. And of course this data G is here. So this is what you would expect to maybe measure in a uh, spec camera. Now, one of the beautiful things about this, and I talked a little bit about this before, is because H is analytically modeled here, um, and this is sort of built into the library, not only do you have access to H, but you have access to a transpose operator H transpose. So if H is mapping you from something in a uh, vector space that looks like F, so 3D objects, to uh, projection data, H transpose is going to get you from projection data to something in object space. Now it's important that H transpose is not equal to H inverse. You can't take projection data and apply the inverse of H to get your um, object data. It turns out H is not invertible for one. And then on top of that, H transpose is not the inverse operation. Um, so that, that's a good point to make. So you can't go back to the original F with it. But if you apply H transpose, you are going to get some sort of 3D object. So we may as well look at what that looks like. So here I have my, uh, I call it backward because this is sort of called back projection. Forward projection is H times F. Back projection is H transpose times G. Remember H transpose operates on things that look like G, not on F. Because H is mapping you from one vector space to a different vector space. So I can call the backward operation on the G data to get something that's going to lie in the original, what we call object space. And this is F backward. And if we look at F backward, it looks a little weird. It doesn't particularly tell us anything necessarily useful about the patient. So this is a 3D object like before, but it looks a little strange and it's certainly not what the original distribution looks like. Now it turns out that this operation H transpose will be used as a sort of piece in a larger puzzle that's part of a reconstruction algorithm. So it is useful as an operator, it's just not particularly useful to directly operate on G to get anything sort of useful with it.
Okay, so we've been able to go from F to G. Now the question is if we have data G, remember this is the sort of thing that you might measure on a real system, how do we go from G back to F? That's the question we're all interested in. We measure data, how do we get that 3D distribution of the patient? So the way we do this is with reconstruction algorithms. So like I said so far, we've considered F and asked what G would look like. That was the whole point of the system modeling before. Uh, in reality, what happens in a real spec scan is one develops a physical system to get G, right? You can build a gamma camera, you can measure spec data, and you can get G. And then what you do is you have a sort of software team as part of Siemens or a company, and they develop a model for that imaging system that models both H but also H transpose. They want to model H as a linear operator. And you want to get an estimate for what F would have been, right? Under G and a good model for the system H, what does F look like? Well, that's where reconstruction algorithms come into play, and that's really the main focus of Pi tomography is working on new reconstruction algorithms. So a reconstruction algorithm works as follows. It's, an, it's, well, it's not an operator, but it's something A. You can think of it like an operator. And A takes in the image data G. This is what you collect using your real physical system. It takes in your model H of the system. This is developed by scientists that model the um, system as a, so, uh, a matrix here. And you plug it into this algorithm that depends on both G and H, and you get an estimate for what your 3D object looks like. That's sort of a mathematical notation of what an algorithm does. So F hat is an estimate for the object F. So it turns out you can't find F exactly, but you can find an estimate for what F probably looks like. And there's many different reconstruction algorithms for different, remember this is sort of uh, imaging system independent. This isn't just SPECT or PET or CT. This could work for any imaging system. Um, as long as you have an operator H that sort of represents how you go from 3D distribution to whatever data that you're measuring. And the reconstruction algorithm you use that's going to be best, of course, will depend on your particular imaging system. So it will depend both on G and on H. Now, the main one that's worked really well for SPECT due to the um, random nature of the data being Poisson is the uh, OSEM. This stands for Ordered Subset Expectation Maximum Algorithm. This is a, the, the most widely used reconstruction algorithm. Anytime somebody gets a spec scan in real life, this is likely the algorithm that's going to be used for reconstruction. And now there are tutorials for other algorithms. Pytomography has many newer algorithms that are being used on the web page. Uh, but here we're going to focus on OSEM just because it's so popular. So in sort of this notation broken down, it looks a little weird here. Uh, you can see I have my system matrix H and I have my image data G and I'm using H to operate on various objects here. So the first thing to note is that you have F hat N M plus one is equal to some function of F hat N M. So it's an iterative algorithm. You update your image estimate based on the last estimate. And it turns out the original estimate is usually one everywhere in space. And then the algorithm will update that to get you a better and better looking image. So in this particular equation, M specifies a subset of projections. So remember, uh, projections are like the different angles that you take of photos of the patient. So a typical spec scan has about 120 total angles. Now it turns out to, to make this algorithm run fast, what you do is you split up those 120 projections into maybe eight subsets of 15 projections each. And your system matrix models only projection to those 15 angles. And then it does it for eight different unique subsets that takes into account all full 120 angles. Um, and so when you do an iterative update, you're really updating using 15 angles, then you move to uh, another 15 different angles, and you do another update, and you move to another 15 angles, and you do another update, and you cycle through all those subsets until you get back to your original set of angles, and then you update again. So you're sort of updating using a subset of the full number of angles used. The reason why you do that is to speed up the algorithm. That's the historical reason. You could use all the angles for every update. That's the MLEM algorithm, but it takes quite a bit longer to run. And while using a subset of the angles isn't as good necessarily, it's been shown to be basically equivalent to a maximum likelihood. So anyways, we'll, we're going to use this algorithm to reconstruct some data G that we have. And of course, we already simulated some data G before. This is basically a summary of everything that we've done before. Only now, instead of three different angles at 0, 20, and 40 degrees, we're going to look at 120 different angles between 0 and 360 degrees. And of course, each of the radii is going to be 15 centimeters. So it's traveling in a circular path here. So then we have basically everything that we did before. We build the attenuation transform and PSF transform. We build the full system matrix. And then we're going to model 
all 120 projections of that uh, system. And so that's what we get with G here. You can see it runs very fast. We're doing correction, PSF, projection, and we're going to be doing it for all 120 angles, and it takes 1.8 seconds. This is the reason why the GPU implementation is so important with Pi Tomography. Okay, so now we're going to create the reconstruction algorithm itself. So we're going to use OSEM. I imported this above. Uh, we have to give our projection data G, and we have to give our system matrix as well that we created. So we create our reconstruction algorithm, and now what we're going to do, remember I said this is iterative, we need to run it so many times. Uh, I'm gonna split it into eight subsets. So if I have 120 projections total, eight subsets mean I consider groups of 15 projections at a time. And I'm gonna run for 10 total iterations. So it's gonna cycle through all those eight different subsets of data 10 times total. And remember, while this is running, all the operations that have to take place you have to forward project F. Then you have to divide G by the image that you get here. Then you have to back project using H transpose. And there's another H transpose here. Then you have to multiply by F. And this is done every single iteration. So you can see that this algorithm is very computationally expensive for what needs to be done. And that's why we implement it on GPU so that this runs in a reasonable amount of time. And I believe this takes about 30 to 40 seconds to finish. Uh, with 10 iterations and eight subsets on this particular GPU. Uh, might be a little bit longer. So finish in about 43.6 seconds and I can plot the data. So remember, this is the original F that we uh, started with before we created the projection data G. And then in the reconstruction algorithm, we use G and we use the sister matrix model to reconstruct what we had projected. And so this is sort of what a reconstructed version of the data would look like. So what you're seeing here is the original image we projected it in Pi Tomography to get a representation of what the image might look like on a spec system, and then we reconstructed that data here. But you might be a little bit annoyed with that because we essentially used the modeling of Pi Tomography to create our image G, right? And so it turns out our system matrix H that we're using in the reconstruction algorithm perfectly matches with the way that we created that data. Now in reality, the image G is not obtained like this, right? You're not simulating a system, you are obtaining that uh, data through some actual spec system and you have to make sure your system matrix H accurately reflects that system. So let's look at some external sources for our image data G. There's actually sort of two main ways of doing this and what's done in research. There's looking at Monte Carlo simulations and there's looking at real spec data, of course, which is the ultimate purpose to image patients um, and find radioactivity distributions. <laughs> So the first case we'll look at is Monte Carlo simulation. So this is like I said before, you have a 3D distribution, a ground truth like what we did, um, but rather than using an analytical model of this system, which is sort of an approximation of what's going on, here you write a full Monte Carlo simulation tracking every single photon through the patient, uh, sort of simulating all the physics, photoelectric effects, Compton scattering, etc. And then the photons exit the patient, then you simulate all the physics in the detector itself whether or not the photons get detected in the crystal, and then you get your image data G. So it's a much more sophisticated model of the imaging system than our analytical model we came up with. So that's one way of sort of modeling HF, a full simulation to get your data G. But the problem with that is there's no concept of H transpose for photon tracking, right? You can track forward and measure the image, but there's not really a back in time operation you can consider. So in terms of reconstruction algorithms, you still need an analytical model for that H transpose. But what Monte Carlo does is it gives you data that very closely resembles what you would get in real life. And furthermore, you know what the ground truth going into the Monte Carlo simulation looks like so you can validate your reconstruction algorithms. So what we'll do here is we'll look at a Monte Carlo simulation of a liver-shaped object. Uh, so for here, we're going to define the projections path. So this is data that came from the Simmond Monte Carlo program. I have a whole tutorial series on Simmond. You can check that out. I'll put a link below. Um, but what we're going to do here is we're going to reconstruct spec data from Simmond. So I'm going to get the uh, path of my projection data. And then from there, we can extract the object metadata. So that's the 3D sort of space, as well as the projection metadata, which gives the angles and radius of the detector from this uh, file called photopeak.h00 and we'll get the projections as well. And this uses the uh, simmond.get metadata. So if you look at the very beginning of my file here, you'll see that one of the things that I imported from Pi Tomography is um, simmond and DICOM. These are two different data formats that we're gonna be looking at in this video.
So the first thing we should ask, okay, well, what are the shape of projections here? So basically, I've simulated a spec scan similar to before. There's 120 different angles that we're taking, and it's going to be 128 by 384. And so what are the units of this data here? It turns out that SIMMOND gives, and the data units are always weird, but they actually make a lot of sense when, once you understand them. The units of this data are in counts per second per megabecquerel. So you have to break that down. What exactly does that mean? How do we get units of counts that represent real projections? Well, there's two things we have to scale by. We have to scale by megabecquerels, and we have to scale by time. Now, the time one is easy. The time is the amount of time that you take per projection. You can take a spec scan for longer or shorter period of time. So we can um, sort of scale it to get what our projections would look like with more time. So if I scan for 15 seconds, I just multiply this data by 15. Um, mega becquerels, this is where Simmond is really clever. You know, it, it, it's basically normalizing the scan as if it were one mega becquerel. And then if you want to simulate, for example, if the patient had eight mega becquerels or 16 mega becquerels or 35, well, then all you have to do is multiply by 35 and then you get that image that um, sort of looks like that. So by multiplying the time per you scan per projection and the megabecquerels, you get units of counts. So in this case, we'll assume that the liver has 100 megabecquerels. That's sort of representative of what you might get in a spec scan. And we're going to be scanning for 15 seconds per projection angle. That's also a typical uh, sort of spec scan. And of course, the important thing here, and the real reason why they sort of give it like this, uh, then you can scale by the Poisson distribution, not scale, but you can derive random variables from that. That's another beautiful thing about Monte Carlo data, the way that Simmond gives it, is I can actually generate multiple noise realizations from the same patient scan very, very fast. Of course, it's a lot faster than running in a whole separate Monte Carlo simulation. So now I get one particular noise realization for the projections, and I can look at my projections at all these different angles. So you can see that it looks like a liver. This is an angle of zero degrees, and I'm sort of uh, imaging or simulating the imaging system at all these different detector angles of scanning the liver. One thing I didn't mention prior, which I should probably mention now, another thing you have to take into account in SPECT imaging is scattering. And scattering is really annoying. And it leads to detection events that come from incorrect lines of response. So what do I mean by that? Well, look at this diagram that I sort of had before and consider the purple line here. It turns out that some of the photons while they initially travel in this sort of direction, which would of course be absorbed by the collimator, they scatter off some attenuating material in the patient and they move in another direction and they might move perpendicular to the detector and get detected. The problem with that is that it breaks your imaging sort of analytical model. Your model says that a photon that's detected here necessarily came from a line that sort of looks like this dotted purple line here. So you've broken your estimate for the, the um, analytical model of the imaging system. And the way to take that into account is to try to estimate what this scatter looks like. So you're adding all these false positive events. It turns out you can take that into account in the reconstruction algorithm in order to correct for this effect of additional events being detected that are actually a result of scatter. So one way to do this, and I'm not going to get too much into this technique, of course, this is the huge field of research, is the triple energy window technique. Um, without worrying too much about what that means, you, you measure photons in a higher energy window. So your, your detector is trying to look for photons that are really, if you're scanning 208 keV, it's going to look for photons that are within an energy range around 208 keV. So you set it to ignore all photons that are in different energy ranges. The triple energy window says you measure events above and below that energy range and you can actually get a good approximation for uh, scattered events. And that's sort of how the triple energy window works. So the lower scatter and upper scatter paths here are where the detector is configured to look for photons that have slightly higher and slightly lower energies. So this is similar to the projection data before. From this, we can use the get scatter from triple energy window method using the peak, lower, and upper uh, paths. And this will give you an estimate for your scatter. So we can actually view what the estimated scatter looks like. What is this uh, uh, sort of distribution of purple lines here that would look like in a real system? And you can see that this is sort of what you would expect the scatter to look like. So I have my image data G here, and I have my scatter data, which I call S here. And if you look at the uh, OSCM reconstruction algorithm, S actually finds a little place here in the denominator. So if you can estimate the scatter, you can include it in the reconstruction algorithm and there's no issues. So then we do everything basically that we did before. Um, we find our attenuation map. So uh, the Monte Carlo program will provide you the attenuation map it used during Monte Carlo modeling. 
Uh, that's this sort of path that I have here. Uh, you can open it using the get attenuation map function of Simmond to create your attenuation transform. Uh, for your PSF, for your collimator detector response modeling, um, you can basically get from directly the projection path, you can get your PSF metadata to build your PSF transform. If you look at um, this file here, the header data for this file, it tells you exactly what the uh, collimator parameters are so you can directly get your PSF metadata as well as the uh, PSF transform you have. So you get your attenuation and your PSF uh, transforms here from which we can build the system matrix like before and from that we can reconstruct like before. So in this case, I feed in the projections, the system matrix. I also feed in the scatter estimate, which of course we derived using the triple energy window method. I didn't go in a lot of depth there, um, but that's essentially what we did. So we define our reconstruction algorithm and like before we can reconstruct and I'll do it for 10 iterations with eight subsets. And there's something I forgot to define here. So I was using the wrong attenuation path here. It should be body1.hct, similar to what we did before. And now we can reconstruct our data here. All right, so the data has been reconstructed. It took about a minute and uh, five seconds here. Um, now, another thing is that sometimes it's desirable to actually smooth your 3D reconstructed image post reconstruction uh, to actually, sometimes the, the image that you reconstruct is a little bit noisy. And so the way to do this is using a Gaussian filter where you essentially just blur the image using a Gaussian filter. Of course, there's functionality in Pi tomography for that as well. So here I define a post smoothing filter. This is something typically done in spec imaging, which has a one centimeter full width at half max. I configure this filter with the object uh, metadata and projection metadata, of course, to get the spacing, um, the voxel size, right? Because I'm using one centimeter full width at max. It needs to know the size of the voxels. And then I apply this post smoothing filter to the reconstructed object. And from there we can view our reconstructed liver with the attenuation map. So here I have my reconstructed uh, object of the liver. Of course, this is just an individual slice. It's a full 3D object. It looks 2D here, but it's full 3D. I can look at different coronal slices of the liver and sort of what the attenuation map here looks like as well. So we've reconstructed data corresponding to a Monte Carlo simulation. But now we get to the real deal. We say, okay, what about data that we collect from real life? And now we're gonna look at clinical data. And so of course, this is really what it's all about, right? You have a patient that has radioactivity in them. You take a picture, which we call G, of that patient, and you wanna use a reconstruction algorithm to get an estimate of what the original distribution looked like. Now, it's very, very hard to get access to open clinical data. But thankfully, the deep blue repository here is actually open source some real spec data of a patient at this link. So you, um, I give the download, by the way, in the original uh, link that I give at the beginning of the video. But this is just sort of a shout out to these guys that have provided this data for people to use uh, open source. So what we're going to do is we're going to reconstruct this data to get a 3D activity map of the patient. So again, it's very similar to what we did with Simmond. We're just doing it for DICOM data now. So here I give the projections path. So this is an actual clinical file. It's a DICOM file. And this corresponds to the DICOM file containing the image G, essentially, what we've looked at before. Uh, and we can also extract the metadata from that and get both the projections as well as the scattered data from that file. And it's going to estimate the scatter from the triple energy window. So for that, there's actually an index peak. This corresponds to the photo peak. This is the index, and that's an index of the DICOM file that corresponds to the detector being set up to look at, for example, if you're scanning 208 keV photons, it's looking for that particular energy. That's the photo peak. And then the lower and the upper are slightly lower, slightly higher. Again, the reason to, for that is to get the estimate for the scatter. Uh, so we can get our projections and scatter. Of course, it's all using the DICOM functionality now rather than what we were using before, which was Simmond. So we can get the projection uh, metadata and we can also get the projections and scatter. And of course, we can view the projections like we did before. The projections, when it gets opened, is simply a, an array like before, only now it's got a slightly larger matrix size. It's 256 by 256. This is actually a high resolution uh, spec image. And of course, it's measured at 120 different projections. So we can view the projections here. And it might be a little bit hard to tell what you're looking at. What we are essentially looking at here, if you look at this sort of region here that kind of looks like a triangle that's light purple, that's the patient's liver. So we're looking really at the center of their body. And um, you can't really see, but you'll see it in the reconstruction. There's sort of a kidney here, as well as some activity uh, elsewhere. 
Now that bright glow in the liver, as we're about to find out, is a tumor. And it doesn't show up in the CT scan. This is why SPECT is so useful. This bright glowing object represents that radioactive molecule binding to the tumor in that location, and then it lights up on the SPECT scan. This is why the image reconstruction is so important. Of course, you could see it in the projections, but it becomes even more apparent when you reconstruct the image. And so we're scanning this sort of central point of the patient's torso at all these different angles here. And so this represents a scan from a real patient. In fact, it doesn't represent it is a scan of a real patient. And so let's set up the system matrix like we did before, like we did with Simmond and like we did the very first time when we were modeling using pi tomography. So in this case, we, like I said, to do attenuation modeling, you need an attenuation map. And what I said before is that every time you do a spec scan, they also do a CT scan, which gives information about the attenuation map. And so it turns out that CT has its own units. They're called Hounsfield units. And it's not trivial to convert from Hounsfield units to attenuation, but there is a conversion that you can go from Hounsfield units to attenuation coefficient. Um, and so this functionality is implemented in pi tomography to be done. So I give the path of the CT data. From that, I extract all the different files. There's CT data is weird. Every single axial slice of the body is stored as a separate file because it's such a big file. Um, so this gives the files of every single sort of slice of the patient, the 3D CT scan that's been reconstructed. So if I just sort of isolate these alone to see what I'm talking about, if I look at files CT now, it's basically a bunch of different files and each one of these files corresponds to a different slice of the patient. That's what I'm talking about. And these files get fed as input to pi tomography function get attenuation map from CT slices, which is essentially what it is. You have all these files of different CT slices from which we can get the attenuation map. And we feed in the um, nuclear medicine file. So this is NM stands for nuclear medicine. What this is is the SPECT data. Uh, we feed in the CT files and we feed in the index peak. It says that you need information about the energy of the uh, spec photons in order to create this attenuation map. The other thing is that the CT scan has different resolution, spacing, and even alignment than the spec scan. So the other thing that this function does is it uses an affine transform to align the CT scan with the spec data. Again, that, that's really getting into the weeds of the library. I don't want to talk about it, but this is what's happening behind the scenes when you create this attenuation map. And like before, you use this attenuation map to create an attenuation transform which eventually gets fed into the system matrix. So here we create our attenuation transform. Of course, you're deriving an attenuation map. You open up all these different CT files. You create a CT scan. You align it with the spec data, and you convert it to um, units of centimeters inverse or attenuation coefficient. Uh, the PSF metadata requires specifying the photon energy that you're looking for. In this case, it's 208 keV because you're looking at lutetium 177. And then also the collimator use. So in this case, we use the Siemens medium energy collimator. That's typically what's done for this particular energy. Of course, there's different collimators for different energies, but that's a whole other rabbit hole to get into. So I specify I use Siemens medium energy. I specify the energy I actually use, which was 208. And from that, I can create my PSF transform, which also gets fed into the system matrix. So now we can build the system matrix like before. Again, you see that the transforms, like all this is essentially code that is sort of the same as the, what we did with Simmond. And even before that, we build our system matrix. We define our reconstruction algorithm. All the arguments we feed in here are the same, only now it's real clinical data. And in this case, we're gonna run it for five iterations and eight subsets to get our reconstructed data. All right, so our image just reconstructed. It took about two minutes and one second to reconstruct. Uh, and we can now finally view what the reconstructed object looks like next to the uh, attenuation map. So the, the attenuation map, of course, is the CT data. And uh, now we're going to review the reconstructed object next to it. So we'll look at the central slice. Remember, it was 256 by 256. So 128 corresponds to the central slice. And if I look at my image here next to the CT scan, here you can see the liver on the right-hand side of the patient. And you can see the corresponding liver here. You can see a little outline of a kidney here as well. And you can see the corresponding kidney here. Uh, and you can also see this bright spot in the liver on the spec scan, which corresponds to, in this case, uh, the tumor that is located in the liver. So this algorithm is really just the most basic OSCM algorithm. We looked at it at three different cases in this video, but there are many more advanced algorithms that pi tomography implements. 
Uh, you can see that in the tutorial sections of uh, the website, which I sort of give a link to here. And that's really the focus of my research as well, is building new algorithms to get better reconstructions than the one you see here. So for more information on that, you can check out the uh, read the docs sort of link here below. Anyways, this was a very long video today. I hope that uh, you learned something interesting. I hope pie tomography uh, at the very least is interesting to you and hopefully even useful in your own research as well.